the best games tell stories. But as I've said before, the best stories are told by history. But in the case of historical games, when they're limited by this history, they can become repetitive, telling the same old story over and over again. So what if we change the story? Is it still history? And as gamers, do we even care? In this last installment of my video series about Dien Bien Phu, I'll explain how this extraordinary story is told by one extraordinary game. Dien Bien Phu is rich with stories. The battle itself is the story of an airborne drop into the wilderness, a relentless besieging army, and the end of a colonial empire. But it's also the story of individual soldiers and units in a way that not many battles are. In his magnificent account, The Last Valley, Dien Bien Phu and the French defeat in Vietnam Martin Windrow writes, In great clashes between entire divisions, the conduct of junior soldiers can rarely have decisive effects. But Dien Bien Phu was an accumulation of strictly local struggles for individual strong points by half battalions, even companies. The outcomes were determined by junior ranks, taking extraordinary responsibilities in the types of actions that can be swayed by the behavior of a few dozen men. This is exactly the kind of battle that traditional war games, with their emphasis on the epic, don't do well, and everything about them, right down to the combat results tables, is about big formations and big results. But that's the way combat results tables have always been, going back to the classics and continuing on for decades. So what are you going to do? Take a tactical system and adapt it to the entire battle? No, I don't think so. This is where a computer game might come to the rescue. But even though a computer game has certain advantages, such as the ability to have multiple scenarios, even ones that are focused on individual strong points, or ones that happened after the actual battle was over, the bottom line is, even with all the bookkeeping the game does, it's just not possible to take a 56 day campaign and play it minute by minute, no matter what the system is. So, what do you do? Dien Bien Phu, The Final Gamble, is from Swedish designer Kim Conger and is published by Legion War Games, a company out of Wisconsin which, in my experience, publishes very high quality physical products. This game is no exception and comes with a beautiful 22 by 34 inch map, a 24 page rule book, 352 large counters, and four player aids, all very nicely done. It also comes with something I think should be in every war game, and that's a full color reproduction of all the counter sheets, front and back, so that you can take an inventory and see if you're missing any counters after a few plays, and if you are, you can make new ones. Dien Bien Phu, the final gamble, plays at the company battalion level, with each French unit representing a company, as in every other game besides La Vallée de la Mort, and each Viet Minh unit represents a battalion as in every other game besides Storm over Dien Bien Phu. Still, the games can't quite agree on just how many battalions the Viet Minh 316th Infantry Division actually had. What's more interesting is its treatment of artillery. In the final gamble, Viet Minh artillery is just represented by markers, and while French artillery units do exist on the map, so that they can be destroyed, the relative artillery strength shows nothing of the Viet Minh superiority that we saw in Citadel or La Vallée de la Mort. So what do you do? Nothing. In fact, 
The October 2014 issue of the Journal of Military History, which came out after the final gamble was released, by the way, suggests that we may have been overestimating Viet Minh's artillery strength at the battle the entire time. Okay, but what about the French Air Force? I mean, we know how many planes the French had, and both Citadel and La Vallée de la Mort include plenty of aircraft counters. <laughs> yeah, that's it. One counter. I talked to him about this, and he had an explanation. Uh, well, unfortunately for the French, they, they, they weren't able to, to, to achieve anything. Mm -hmm. And it's correct. They tried to bomb the Viet Minh positions in the forest, and it no, achieved mm -hmm. nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. Nothing. And they tried to bomb them out in the fields, but, but uh, since the Viet Minh were, were digging all these trenches, mm -hmm. they could just uh, lower their heads. This is something that the late, great, and very much missed John Hill, designer of squad leader, called Design for Effect. This is the idea that it's not so much what the individual elements in your game represent as what their overall effect is. But Kanger doesn't make this choice with two other key historical elements because he clearly understands what he's trying to do. Tell a story. The first is Strong Point Isabel, that detached French Strong Point far to the south of the main French position. Of the three previous games, both Citadel and La Vallée de la Mort included it as a contiguous part of the map, making for a long, narrow playing area while Storm over Dien Bien Phu just omitted it. We asked an expert what he thought of this. So how can you just remove a third of the battlefield from the map and still call it a historical war game? Yeah, I don't really have a problem with it. Doesn't that fly in the face of historical accuracy? Well, I mean, it's not so much a question of historical accuracy, right? I mean, if you want a historical accuracy, you just open up the box, say, the French lose, the Viet Minh win, and close it up and you're done. Well, do you think it has any effect on the simulation or the representation at all? Well, I think it does change the sense of place. I mean, Dien Bien Phu is a very recognizable valley with Isabel at the south end, Gabriel at the north end, and a bunch of central strong points. And I think if you take it out and you compress the whole map, you sort of lose that feeling of Dien Bien Phu. So I, I, do, I do agree that that could be a problem, but I'm willing to give the designer the benefit of the doubt until I find out otherwise. What you're really doing is interpreting history in game form, right? So, I mean, if you feel that your particular interpretation is aided by the exclusion of things that you think are peripheral, I, I don't see why that should be a problem. Kim Conger includes Isabel in the final gamble, but what matters is how. His Isabel is a minimal hex grid marooned in a sea of boxes, reachable only by special movement. But this detachment allows him to add additional boxes for the relief force from Laos, without making it seem tacked on or extraneous. And there's nothing that tells a story quite like our rescuing army marching to relieve a siege through the wilderness. Kanger ties this relief force into his second key decision, in which he decides to go for more instead of less. The supply system. One of the iconic elements of the Dien Bien Phu story is the French airdrop effort to provide supply to the besieged fortress. The other games we've explored either used a simple supply point system or just totally omitted supply counts in favor of an abstract out of supply die roll. Conger goes the other way entirely and he goes all in. The French have four separate supply types to keep track of. Fuel and spares, food and bullets, medicine, and ammo with tracks for each one. This seems like an awfully specific depiction of supply, and it is, but it differs from gaming literalism in that instead of being specific out of sheer compulsion, it's specific because that specificity makes sense. Congress has already dispensed with having Viet Minh artillery units on the map board, as well as most of the French Air Force, but he makes a supply distinction between bandages and cheese because he uses this supply distinction to tie the whole game together. Every element of Dien Bien Phu, the final gamble, depends in one way or another on these four supply types. And not in a fiddly way either. This takes some explaining, because unless you see how the game's systems are linked, you can't appreciate how the supply system ties them all up neatly together. Fortunately, Kim Conger and I played an entire campaign game of the final gamble against each other on Vassal about six months after the game was released. And I can show you exactly why the game works so well, 
by narrating this particular game. French infantry units in the final gamble just have a morale and a combat strength. French artillery units just have a morale value because they can't be the lead unit in assault combat unless they are alone in the hex, in which case they defend with a strength of two. Viet Minh infantry units just have a combat value because their morale is a variable based on their losses and replacements. Okay, one exception. The units of the elite 148th regiment always have a morale of five. Units can take step losses, in which case they are flipped to the reduced side. Viet Minh units actually have three steps, and the loss of a second step is shown by the placement of a cadre marker. As we discussed before, there are no Viet Minh artillery units, just markers for where their barrages are placed. The map covers the entire battlefield, along with Isabel detached to the south as we discussed before, which is to the far right of the screen in the vassal module. As the French, I set up my units according to scenario A, which places units in their historical positions at the start of the battle, including the doomed outlying strong points. The game scale is three days per turn, so the historical assaults on Beatrice and Gabrielle occur on the same turn if you play the way Giap did. The Viet Minh is set up by division, so the task of capturing Gabrielle falls to the 308th Infantry Division. Gabrielle is defended by the 5th Battalion of the 7th Algerian Tirailleurs, along with a company of 120mm mortars. First, the Viet Minh conduct their artillery barrage. All told, Kim places 12 artillery markers, 4 here, 4 at Beatrice, and 4 elsewhere. The heavy weapons marker, designated by HW, can only be placed within two hexes of a Viet Minh unit, while the regular artillery markers can fire further only if they are placed on strong points. This is a nice way to model the restricted Viet Minh artillery without getting bogged down in things like fire arcs. Each artillery marker uses one ammo point, deducted from the Viet Minh total. Then the Viet Minh player rolls for each marker he or she placed. The Viet Minh dice are different colors for a reason. The black die is the shock die, and the white die is the lost die. Each artillery marker affects its own hex, plus the adjacent six hexes, called a barrage zone. Any unit in the barrage zone with a morale lower than the shock die gets shaken, which will make it more vulnerable to attack. The heavy weapons marker barrage zone affects all of Gabrielle, and since every unit here has a morale of four, each unit in the strong point is shaken. For the lost die, you total all the defending units in the barrage zone, with reduced units counting as half a unit. If the roll is equal to or lower than the total, the defender loses one step. The step choice is made by the Viet Minh if the roll is odd, and by the French if the roll is even. Since Kim rolled a 1, he gets to choose the unit that takes the loss, and he chooses the single unit in the southeast corner of the strong point, hoping that a subsequent barrage will give him another choice that it will allow him to eliminate that unit entirely. Now he continues to resolve the barrages given by his artillery markers. That's a great roll for Kim, because even though the shock die is ineffectual, all the units are already shaken, and you can't be shaken twice while the lost die inflicts another loss that Kim gets to choose. He chooses the already reduced Algerian unit in the southeast corner, leaving that part of the strong point unprotected. He still has two barrages to go. Since there are only five units in the artillery marker's barrage zone, the six Kim rolled on the lost die has no effect. The shock die continues to have no effect as all units are already shaken. One more roll to go. The 2 is less than the 5 units in this barrage zone, meaning I have to take a step loss, but it's an even roll, meaning that the French get to choose. I take it out of the Thai company stacked in the southwest corner of the strong point, since this is my least important unit right now. Here come the Viet Minh. The Viet Minh have multiple ways to move, including valley moves to reposition their forces, and box moves to use the off-map boxes. But this is the Viet Minh tactical move segment, and each unit gets 5 movement points. The terrain is mostly field, which costs 1 movement point per hex before the monsoon, which this is. Viet Minh units would have to pay an extra movement point and stop when entering French zone of control, but the fact that these units are all shaken means they lose their zone of control, making the Viet Minh move to surround Gabrielle much easier. In fact, the Viet Minh battalion that moves into the actual strong point couldn't get there if the French still had ZOC, because it is both moving uphill and crossing heavy wire, two obstacles that cost plus one movement point each. 
Without the ZOC penalty, this Viet Minh battalion can just barely make it into the hex, shutting the door on Gabrielle and making a potential French relief much harder. Since units can only become shaken through artillery bombardment, this makes the decision to use artillery, and thus ammo, in an assault very important. You might wonder, why are some hexes shaded darker than others? This marks the Viet Minh trench zones. These provide entrenchment benefit and restrict French movement when the Viet Minh trench marker advances to that zone. Once all strong points in the zone are cleared, the marker can be placed on its trench side. The following turn, it is eligible to move forward and flip to its dig side, providing protection for the Viet Minh as they assault the next belt of strong points. Once these strong points have been cleared, the trench zone encompasses all previous zones. As a nice touch, to aid in planning, Kim provides a play aid that clearly marks all the trench zones that exist on the map. Now, you could make the argument that actually fixing the trench zones on the map stereotypes play to some degree, because it might mean that the approach to each strong point is the same in each game, therefore taking away some variety. Like I said, you could make that argument. But unless you're some kind of super gaming literalist, every single design decision is going to come with a trade-off. And I think there are enough different ways to approach each strong point that games aren't going to be driven down one track just by the placement of the trench zones. And I think that Kim makes the right decision here, because the ability to quantify those trench zones and then use them to represent the decreasing French perimeter for purposes of airdrops pays big dividends later. But let's get back to the assault. The next step is Viet Minh Assault Declaration. Only one unit can assault a given hex, so Kim chooses his three lead battalions and leaves the others to provide support. Then I allocate my artillery, trying to shake his supporting battalion so they can't provide that support. These are called reaction barrages and differ from the ones allocated to the assaulting units themselves, which are called support barrages. Reaction barrages get a die roll and can shake, reduce, or shake and reduce a supporting unit. Supporting units that are shaken lose their ability to provide support. Support barrages won't get die rolls, but instead will give me a bonus in my defensive fire. Oh, and what about barrage zones? Sorry, only the Viet Minh get those. Each French artillery marker affects a single hex. Anyway, I don't shake any Viet Minh units, but manage to reduce one. Sadly, this won't affect the assault. All defensive fire is resolved before the assaults are. For the first hex, I have two units, but since one is artillery, my lead defender has to be the 5-7 RTA infantry. This unit starts with a base combat strength of 7, shown in the lower left corner. The artillery unit does provide me with support though, and I get additional modifiers for the fact that the Viet Minh unit is crossing a heavy wire obstacle. I also get plus 1 for the support barrage. I add these modifiers, plus 1 for the additional unit in the same hex, plus 1 for the wire, and plus 1 for the support barrage, for a total of plus 3, and then subtract minus 2 because the units are shaken. That's 7 plus 1 for a modified combat strength of 8. Now I roll two dice and hope to roll less than this modified combat strength. 8. That's exactly equal to my combat strength, so my defensive fire gets no actual modifier to the roll. Now look at the defensive fire column that corresponds to the attacker's morale, which is 5 right now. Use the column that accounts for my support barrage, which means a shift left, and now I roll one die, which is my defensive fire roll. A six. That's pretty great. The Viet Minh take a step loss and have to abort the assault. That means no actual assault is going to take place into that hex. The Algerians and Gabrielle have kept the entire 102nd Regiment of the Viet Minh 308th Division at bay. But there are two more assaults to go. The next defender is a single company of the 5-7 RTA without support. However, this defensive fire gets a plus one modifier for the attack being uphill, as well as wire and support barrage, with minus two for shaken, so the net is the same as the previous defensive fire, and the modified combat strength is eight again. Six. That's less than the combat strength, but not five less, so I get a plus one to my defensive fire roll. Four. Four plus one is modified to five. That's a loss and hesitate. The assault will go through, but on a less advantageous column. The last defensive fire is against an attack that is uphill and across wire. I also have a support barrage allocated and a tie company in the same hex for a total of plus four. Subtract two for being shaken again 
and that's a net plus two and my modified combat strength is nine. Unfortunately, I roll a nine, so I don't get any modifier to this roll either. Here's the last of the Gabrielle defenders trying to hold off the Viet Minh waves. Five, another loss and hesitate. I got some great rolls here, and with the abort, I know at least two units will live through this assault, but the strong point is still surrounded. The Viet Minh assaults use the same mechanism as the French defensive fire. Roll against your combat strength for a modifier, then roll on a combat table. But the combat table shifts based on what happens during defensive fire, and an assaulting unit's combat strength can be reduced if it takes a step loss. The two Viet Minh units here that still get to assault were both reduced, so their base combat strength is 7. They do get plus 1 per supporting battalion from the same regiment adjacent to the defending unit, as long as that supporting unit isn't shaken or stirred or attacking someone. The counters have both numbers and shapes to remind you which battalions belong to the same regiment. The 36th Regiment of the 308th Division, or the Squares, has two units in support for a modifier of plus two. The French are entrenched, though, for a modifier of minus two. The modified combat strength is seven. Ten. That's higher than the combat strength, but not five higher. Kim is penalized with a minus one modifier on the hesitate table. Five. Modified to four, that gives a result of choice on the hesitate table. I can either take a step loss or retreat. I take the loss. Kim has one assault left, also on the hesitate table, with the exact same modifiers as before. 7, which equals his combat strength and gives no modifiers to the assault roll. A 1. That's no effect, and the assault on Gabrielle, other than the bombardment, has been pretty unsuccessful. But now the French are isolated, meaning if I don't reopen a supply line during my part of the turn, these units will be gone forever. This is one of the main design decisions that I think Kim Conger gets completely right. Even as it diverges from what we normally associate with historical wargaming as quantitation of force. Because at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, units could have quite variable performance histories. A unit that was ferocious on the assault or on the defense on one day might not be so on the next. And this doesn't fit well with an odds-based combat system in which the whole point is to keep adding force until you get to that magical odds ratio that pretty much guarantees success. Because there was no guaranteed success at Dien Bien Phu, as both the French and the Viet Minh found out on multiple occasions. As Martin Windrow points out, this is a battle in which the conduct of junior officers was decisive in a way that you're not going to see in a game about something like, well, Stalingrad, for example. In this game, any unit on the right day can get that magical plus two die roll modifier. On that day, thanks to its junior officers, for that unit, none shall pass. The Viet Minh didn't just attack Gabrielle. Kim took Huget 7, Anne Marie, and had some better luck at Beatrice than he had at Gabby. The French will start their portion of the turn facing some tough choices, because they can't afford to let all of these isolated troops be taken prisoner and thus out of the game but trying to rescue everyone risks rescuing no one. The French rescue effort will be dictated by their valley movement and tactical moves. Citadel exposed the fallacious logic that just because a unit could have moved across the valley in a time that represented less than one game turn, you could just eliminate movement points. <laughs> just because one unit could move across the valley in a day doesn't mean that the Viet Minh or French could move all their units at once, which is what Citadel asserted. In fact, the French, even with all their trucks, could only really move a couple battalions at a time. As we'll see in a bit, the French can make unlimited moves with only a few units. Before the French rescue efforts get underway, they have to pay for their supply requirement. Like I said, the supply system in Final Gamble is detailed, but it's detailed with a purpose. And I think this purpose is not only to accurately represent the supply situation at Dien Bien Phu, but also to let you play a really cool minigame about supply drops. Each turn, the French have access to stacks of supply counters in their Hanoi airbase. But the problem is how to get these from the Hanoi airbase to the Dien Bien Phu garrison. Kanger creates an ingenious drop matrix that forces you to consider each type of cargo and then makes you agonize as your planes abort their drops for various reasons. Once you've rolled for how many aborts there will be, you roll two dice that many times to see which loads you lose. I think this may be my favorite war game mechanic of all time. Not only is it incredibly simple, but it provides tension, theme, and historical narrative in a way that also captures the historical effect. 
and it ties together a bunch of disparate factors in a way that I can only describe as good interface design. As the Viet Minh trench zones increase, the number of available load boxes shrinks, reflecting the smaller area available for airdrops. The rain and monsoon decrease the number of load boxes due to restricted flying conditions. And if you send the Laos Relief Force in, you have to divert aircraft to supply them, further reducing your load capacity. There are so many things about this that work, not least because it shows the difference between a rope mechanic and one that keeps you engaged. Consider a system that just includes supply and reinforcements. This differentiation will make you focus on the reinforcements, which are probably more important individually than generic supply points. So your anticipation will peak when you roll for their survival. After that, you're just rolling for stuff you have less investment in, leading to the phenomenon of endless die rolls. But in Final Gamble, your reinforcements aren't safe until you complete your last die roll, making you focus on each one. Also, each of the supply types has a separate use, and its loss or survival affects the supply situation in a different way. Sure, you could just have the French spend generic supply points on various things, but this would ignore one of the biggest French dilemmas, which is what to drop on any given day. In response to the enormous and unexpected casualties, the French dropped two additional surgical teams into the fortress, and medical supplies were always scarce. But every plane load of medical supplies was a plane load that wasn't full of 105mm howitzer ammo. Making decisions about cargo was one of the most pressing problems the French had, and making the player deal with what is almost a logistical minigame is very appropriate in my view. Once the French airdrops are complete, it's time for French movement. Final Gamble models the fact that the French simply didn't have the transport to effectively deploy much more than a battalion of troops in any offensive capacity. So while you can move units almost as far as you want, you can't move many. The French can only move four companies during their valley move, six if they all come from the central supply area. This reflects the fact that the French concentrated their motor pool. To rescue Gabriel, I detailed parts of two battalions of elite French paras, the 8th Colonials, better known as 8th Shock, and the 1st Battalion Foreign Legion Paratroops, plus a tank platoon. The French start out their assault by designating artillery fire. Unlike the Viet Minh, they don't get barrage zones, but simply resolve each barrage against an individual hex. The French get a plus one modifier if they use an intense barrage, which uses two ammo instead of one, and another plus one if the Viet Minh are not entrenched. A modified five or higher reduces the Viet Minh unit, and shakes it if the modified roll is greater than the Viet Minh's morale. You may have noticed that the French units lost their shaken status, and one of the Viet Minh units gained it even before the French started their turn. This is because shaken status is essentially a defensive penalty, and all units that are adjacent to enemy units without being entrenched themselves become shaken at the end of their player turn. Kim left a unit south of Gabriel to make me fight through his cordon, but it's outside of his trench zone. This makes being entrenched that much more important, as being shaken is a significant disadvantage, and the only other way to become shaken is by artillery bombardment. With the Viet Minh defenders softened up, the elite French paratroops move in for the assault. They get five movement points during the tactical phase, just like the Viet Minh did. Any unit on the map can use tactical movement, but there isn't anywhere else I can counterattack right now, so all the action is here. Because friendly units negate enemy zone of control for supply purposes, all I need is to get one unit adjacent to the southernmost isolated unit, and I can extract the defenders. Viet Minh defensive fire is identical to French defensive fire. Kim did assign a support barrage to this division, but for the Viet Minh, there is no plus one die roll modifier, just the favorable column shift. He has no supporting units adjacent to the attackers. With minus two for Shaken, this reduced battalion has a modified combat strength of five. That's an eight, which is higher than the combat strength, but not five higher. Kim will roll with a minus one die roll modifier. A five, modified to four, that's a step loss. My attacking unit is reduced, but will be able to assault normally. The other Viet Minh unit is an identical situation with no support. While it is entrenched, that factors into the assault roll, not defensive fire. A 6. That's close, but still greater than the combat strength. 
Another defensive fire roll with a minus one modifier. Two. Ouch. Modified to one, that's a surprise. The first four in Legion paratroops, thanks in part to their morale of five, have achieved a surprise attack. Nice work, messieurs. Now the assaults roll in. Eighth shock, under the historical command of Captain Pierre Touré, had its attacking unit reduced. But I can switch my attacking units due to French tactical flexibility and use my fresh company in the assault. I get plus one for the other company in my hex and plus two for the tank platoon. The Viet Minh are not entrenched because they're outside of the trench zone, so my modified combat strength is seven plus three and ten. Seven. That's not five less than my combat strength, but it's still less. I'll have to settle for a plus one modifier. A four. Modified to five, that's a loss in retreat on the normal column. The Viet Minh unit is reduced to a cadre and has to retreat. Since the Viet Minh can't stack, it has to retreat an additional hex. The Colonials advance into the Defender's Hex. Supply is re-established, no matter what happens next. Now the Legionnaires. They had two units in support, but this Viet Minh unit is entrenched for a modified strength of seven. Five. That gives me a plus one die roll modifier to this assault as well. Good luck for me so far. Another four. Modified to five, that's another loss in retreat. Again, Kim can't stack, so he has to retreat an additional hex. My legionnaires advance into this hex as well. The combat system tells a great story in this way, even more so because Conger gives defensive fire a concrete result, like hesitate, abort, or surprise, instead of just adding modifiers. This builds both anticipation and narrative. Stratifying the outcomes ensures that hesitate isn't just assault minus one because of the way the columns have both a floor and a ceiling. This fixes your attention on the intermediate result, making it an outcome in itself. It's one thing to see the Viet Minh overwhelmed by the French paras with a plus one modifier, and another to see them do it with a surprise attack. Especially if you have to wait to resolve that surprise attack until all the defensive fire is over. Don't tell me that game pacing just applies to video games. At this point, I could move my relief force up into the strong point. But just like in real life, there's no point in feeding more men into a position that's just going to get pounded by artillery again. Because of the way the lost die roll works, the more men I pack into the strong point, the more I lose. However, since friendly units negate enemy zones of control, my previously isolated units are now in supply and can use post-combat movement. French units can rearrange themselves in new entrenchments if they have the movement points to get there, or they can be evacuated all the way back to the central supply area. That's what I'll do here as well as move my rescuing force back whence it came. I've lost Gabby, but my forces live to fight again. On the first turn, Kim captured 12 hexes worth of strong points. You get credit for all of the hexes of an individual strong point at once after you've cleared it. This has a couple of effects. The first is to drive the Viet Minh timetable, according to which you have to do at least as well as the historical Viet Minh did on each turn or suffer a morale penalty. The second is that when the total number of strong points gets low enough, the number of strong points that are captured on one turn becomes a die roll modifier that can push the French into surrender. I think one of Conger's biggest design achievements with this game, which I don't think even Citadel gets right, is the establishment of the concept of entrenchments. Every account of the battle makes it clear that the combatants fought both from and for strong points, not just terrain. It's something that should be foremost in your mind no matter which side you're playing. I think the biggest failing of Storm Over DNB and Fu, actually, was the way that the areas homogenized the map. Because the defender doesn't roll dice in combat in the modified Storm Over system, this dilutes out the high terrain effect modifier areas so that they're much less important. Remember how tough the tractor factory felt with that plus four TEM in Turning Point Stalingrad? <laughs> yeah. In Storm Over DNB and Fu, as well as the other games, really. This effect is pretty much lost. It's at this point that we can see how the system brings all its elements together. The combat table is very dependent on the morale of the unit being fired at. The lower your morale gets, the more likely you are to abort when attacking, or take losses when defending. Furthermore, a morale 5 unit will abort an assault only if the defender uses a support barrage, and even then only on a modified roll of 6. That means a big drop off in your assault efficiency from morale 5 to morale 4. Lower than that, and you're in real trouble. 
Furthermore, if you look at the defensive fire table, while a morale 5 unit may not abort, it will almost always take a step loss in the assault. So your morale 5 units are critical to your success, even as they will certainly wear down in repeated assaults. This creates different problems for the French and the Viet Minh. The French have a finite number of morale 5 units, which are their paratroops. As the game progresses, the French will see their units worn down to the point where most of them will have step losses. And what happens to a unit that has a step loss if it takes another one? It's eliminated. So you have to constantly weigh the risks and benefits of counterattacks because those para-steps are so precious, just like they were in real life. But you can only flip a unit back to full strength once it gets reduced by using a replacement. And you get one replacement counter per turn, which has to make it all the way through the airdrop matrix before it gets to you. The thing is, eliminated units can also end up in the wounded box, from where they can be brought back at reduced strength, albeit in exchange for a significant number of medicine points. But as long as they stay in the wounded box, they require medicine points just for maintenance, and if you don't have enough medicine, you start taking more step losses, as is the case with food. But remember that you can only force an assaulting morale 5 unit to abort if you have a support barrage. So you'll be needing ammo all the way through the game, right to the very end. The Viet Minh have a different problem. They have plentiful, although not infinite, replacements. And if you noticed, they only have one number on their counters, which is their combat strength. That's because their morale is a variable that depends on their losses. Each division starts at morale 5 and loses points on this morale track for each replacement it takes. This cleverly reflects the assimilation of young, untrained recruits and gives the Viet Minh player a dilemma. Take replacements and bring morale down, or keep fighting with depleted battalions and eventually have to pull them back. Not attacking with a division for an entire turn restores one precious box of morale, but as the Viet Minh, you have that inexorable historical schedule to keep. If you have fewer strong points on a given day than the turn record track requires, each one of your divisions loses a box of morale. When you cross one of the morale thresholds on the track, every single unit in that division changes its morale number. So you can't rest too often, can't take too many replacements, but still need to keep the assault rolling. It's no picnic. Kim and I ran into all of these problems during our game. I was chronically short of ammo, not least because of fuel shortages that prevented me from collecting more than a fraction of the ammo I could drop. When Kim used a lot of barrage markers, he also inflicted truck losses, further depleting my ammo replenishment. My casualties piled up, costing me lots of medicine to maintain. My troops inflicted heavy casualties on him, though, as his battalions became reduced and his reduced battalions became cadres. He pushed me back first in the south, then in the north and west. Eventually, it was turn 21, the last turn, and I was essentially defending the central supply area, having lost all but a few of the protective strong points. Isabel, though, still held out. Turn 21 is the last turn of the game, and the campaign has already gone on longer than it did historically, as we're now in mid-May. Kim is trying to land the killing blow, but his losses have reduced all of his divisions to morale 4. Both armies are at the ends of their ropes. The game's victory condition is simple. The French surrender, or they win. In order to surrender, they have to fail a surrender die roll, which happens right before the French player turn starts. You calculate it by counting the number of strong points the French still control, subtract their net losses for the turn, which is sort of a momentum bonus for the Viet Minh, add some modifiers for the supply state and the location of the Laos relief force, and voila, you have a number. If the Viet Minh roll two higher than this number on two six-sided dice, the French surrender immediately. Roll one higher and some French low morale units desert, but the French fight on. This roll happens every turn, but when the French control 50-something strong points, it's obviously not worth calculating an actual surrender number. When the game gets to this point, though, the French can get pushed over the edge if they lose a lot of strong points on one turn. The French strong point track is at 17 when the turn starts, and gets adjusted at the beginning of the French player turn. Because the Viet Minh don't get credit for a strong point until they control all of its hexes, Kim still hasn't gotten any points for Epalvier, of which I still control two of the four hexes, or Junon, of which I hold on to one of its two hexes. Losing both of these strong points would cost me six strong points on the track, four for Epalvier and two for Junon, and take me to 11, which is 17 minus 6, and push the strong points captured up to 6, and that would make the surrender number 11 minus 6 equals 5, even without any other modifiers for supply or other strong points captured. Kim would have to roll a 7 to win. 
Another thing that Kim can get credit for is structures like hospitals and fuel and ammo dumps which are structures and provide no defensive benefit but count against the French on the strong points track when they lose them. It's a bad day on the midway for the French army into China, no matter how you slice it here. Kim starts out by taking a hex of Elion 12, but the first foreign legion Paris hold the other hex and Kim fails to take that strong point. Now he turns his attention to Apervier, or Sparrowhawk in English. Kim holds two hexes of that strong point, but needs to evict me from the other two in order to rack up the four strong point points. The first hex is held by a Thai company and some artillery. A battalion of the 316th Viet Minh Infantry Division drives these units out, and the last hex is held by just one artillery counter, the 2nd Battalion of the 4th Colonial Artillery Regiment. These are West African gunners under French officers. I'll let Kim's vassal text narrate some here. His combat value is 6, but he rolls an 8, so he suffers a minus 1 modifier to his assault roll. His assault roll is a 6 modified to a 5. This yields choice. I can take a step loss or a retreat. Since this is the last turn, a retreat does me no good. I stay in the hex, and the West African Tirailleurs have turned back the Viet Minh at Epervier. Kim points out that the second of the fourth colonial artillery is famous. In the actual battle, it turned back a Viet Minh assault on Dominique III during the Battle of the Five Hills. According to Martin Windrow, when the Viet Minh infantry finally rushed the battery position, dimly lit up by parachute flares, Lieutenant Bunbroek gave an order that was seldom heard in the 20th century. Debouché à zéro! Point blank! The howitzer barrels were lowered to aim directly at the enemy mass, and the fuses were set to minimum delay. The shells exploded just yards ahead of the muzzles, tearing bloody avenues through the closely packed Viet Minh. This is the basis for a card included in Storm Over Dien Bien Phu. Debouché à zéro! After all the assaults are done, Kim has managed to take one strong point, the artillery pit. He has also taken four structure hexes, the fuel depot, the ammo dump, and two hospitals. That's a total of five structures and strong points, and I go from 17 strong points to 12 on the track. The red strong points taken marker goes to five for the artillery pit plus the four structures. 12 minus five is seven. Kim needs to roll a nine to win. But he doesn't. Viva la France! I get unique satisfaction out of playing games with strong storytelling elements, but that also manage to capture historical factors with clever game mechanics. Too often, games seem to diverge either into mechanical micromanagement or a scripted history lesson. The final gamble builds its story on a foundation of interwoven mechanics without becoming a slave to them. These mechanics both capture the history and allow for deviation from it. You can see this in the attention to aesthetic detail with evocative counter illustrations, French and Vietnamese geographic designations on the map, and a scenario card that includes beautiful unit insignias. Even the French reinforcement mechanic, which increases the likelihood of reinforcements with each French unit lost, includes a narrative wrapper that references the frequent disappointment the Dien Bien Phu commanders felt when the requests for troops were rejected, and makes you feel this as well. This kind of storytelling is a hallmark of Kim Kanger's designs, but is on a completely different level than roll and scroll story engines like B-17, Queen of the Skies, or The Hunters. The aesthetic elements work with the gameplay in a way that makes you remember which unit was responsible for the day's heroics, like our brave West African royal colonials in my game against Kim. When I talked to Kim about his games, he told me that he just couldn't leave the units involved in the battle without finishing their story, as he had already followed some of these units from French into China to Algeria when he designed Ici C'est la France. In fact, I think that some of the success of Dien Bien Phu The Final Gamble comes down to just how well Kim has come to know his protagonists. Many of the units in The Final Gamble have now appeared in three of his games. We've now examined four different approaches to Dien Bien Phu, so let's take a look at how our games fare on the wargaming triangle we discussed in the very first episode. Citadel clearly pins its design on evocative mechanics, but this compromises both its historical accuracy and I also think the balance. Storm over Dien Bien Phu goes straight for competitive balance, but pairs so much down to do it that it isn't very historically accurate 
and completely fails to evoke anything. La Vallée de l'Amour clearly goes for both evocative mechanics and some historical accuracy, but is the least balanced of the four games. Only Dien Bien Phu, the final gamble, squarely covers all three angles. I really like Dien Bien Phu, the final gamble, so much so that I named it my favorite war game of all time on my podcast, Wild Weasel. I think it does a tremendous job in synthesizing everything that I find attractive about wargaming, and it shows a creativity in design that I haven't seen in many other games I've played. The campaign scenario will take you about 12 hours against a live opponent, based on my experience, although there are shorter scenarios, the shortest one of which is about seven turns. That may take you four to five hours if you're experienced. Oh, and the publisher informs me that the game is now out of print. So if you want to get a copy, they're going to reprint it after there are 150 pre-orders. I guess it's like a P150 at this point. I like the game so much. I stashed away another copy. This concludes my video series on war games about Tian Bien Phu. I've had a great time making it. I hope you've enjoyed watching it. If this is the first one of these videos that you've seen, consider watching some of the others by going to my channel and clicking on the Dien Bien Phu playlist. And if you'd like to see more videos or video series, please go to my website, wargamespace.com, and put your suggestions in the comments section. Until then, we'll see you next time. And thanks for watching. If you're interested in reading more about Dien Bien Phu, I have some recommendations for you. The first is Bernard Fall's classic, Hell in a Very Small Place. Bernard Fall was a French-Austrian journalist who got his PhD in the United States at Syracuse University and became an expert on Indochina. He was unfortunately killed in 1967 while embedded with U.S. troops in Vietnam. But Hell in a Very Small Place is a classic. It was written in 1966, it is tremendously well written and it was the first book to use a lot of French archival material unavailable to previous authors. If you read one book about Dien Bien Phu, it should be this. For a long time, the so-called other book in English about Dien Bien Phu was The Battle of Dien Bien Phu by Jules Roy. It was published in French in 1963 and translated into English a few years later. It was a bestseller in France, and although Roy didn't fight at Dien Bien Phu, he was an Air Force officer, and he got access to a lot of veterans who did fight there. The book is written in a more novelistic style, although it is a history, but it's a little more breezily written than Bernard Fall's book. I prefer Fall's style, but I think Ra's book is really good, and if you prefer more of a page-turning type of approach to the battle, then this is the one to read. Moving to more recent books, Martin Windrow's The Last Valley was written in 2004 for the 50th anniversary of the battle. Windrow is a British author and journalist who didn't do any archival research. Instead, he synthesized a large number of secondary sources, most of which were in French and unavailable to English readers. It's excellent for non-military readers because it explains a lot of terms that wouldn't otherwise be obvious. It also has very clever footnotes. If you want a book that explains the battle to you in very clear terms for general readers, this is the one to read. Valley of Death was written by Ted Morgan and published in 2010. Ted Morgan was actually from a French aristocratic family, went to Yale, then served in the French Army, but later became an American citizen and worked for the Washington Post for a long time and won a Pulitzer for local reporting. He also wrote a great biography of Winston Churchill, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer in biography at that time. Valley of Death is a good book for American readers because it explains a lot of the political background of Dien Bien Phu from the American side before the Americans became heavily involved in Vietnam. Otherwise, it's not quite as in-depth a book as Martin Windrow's, or spectacularly well written as Bernard Falls. Still, it has some information that aren't going to be found in those other two books, so if you want that kind of American political background,
this would be a good place to go for it. The previous four books were really military history, but if you're looking for a political history of Vietnam from before World War II until the end of the French involvement and the beginning of the American involvement, you have to read Embers of War by Frederick Logeval. Logeval is a scholar at Cornell, and Embers of War is probably going to be the definitive English book about the subject for the foreseeable future. It talks about the fall of French colonialism, then the aftermath of World War II, how the French colonial infrastructure was reestablished, the whole of the French Indochina War, and the beginnings of American involvement. There's not as much military history in this book, but once you've read one of the others, this is a great place to go for further background. It's indispensable. While not specifically about Tian Bien Phu, Bernard Fall's Street Without Joy, about the French debacle in Indochina, is absolutely worth reading. It has a lot of background material that will make Tian Bien Phu make more sense, and once again, is so well written that you're going to love to read it because you're going to miss his writing style after you're done with Hell in a Very Small Place. It's kind of a bonus book, but I would definitely recommend reading this as well.